Picture record is gone. On. Let me go to the website. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's see. C, 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 so I think it's good, about just about the right level, not too loud, okay. And you can hear that my voice is slowly recovering from the audit coughing last week and stuff like that. All right, CISP 440, there we go. Okay, so before I start the lecture, I just want to let you guys know that ARC as a campus um, is going to try to apply for a grant to do this. Okay, let me show you what I mean by that. CCC Maker, that should land us to the web page. So CCC stands for the California Community College. So this is from the Chancellor's Office. This is not a uh, lost real thing. This is like a statewide thing. Um, so they are trying to use, utilize or make use of the maker movement, which m many of you already know what it is kind of at least vaguely about, right? So they're trying to utilize the momentum of the maker movement uh, to help students, you know, to help students land an uh, internship, paid internships to be more exact. So this is kind of cool, you know, we are, um, we have applied as a college, we have applied to uh, participate in this program so they have already given us some money to start with the process so the interesting thing is they give us about you know 40 up to forty thousand dollars to get the grant the actual grant proposal done so once they accept the actual grant proposal for implementation then we can get from any, anywhere from one hundred thousand dollars to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the first phase of the implementation if they see success you know, of the first phase, there's also a second phase of about the same amount of money from $100,000 $100, to $350,000. Okay, so you're talking about $0.35 million, basically. So it's kind of cool, kind of neat. Um, but for those of you who are kind of new to this and go like, well, you know, I don't know about Maker because I'm a computer science student. Well, that's one of the things about, you know, the stereotype of a computer science student is we just like to sit in front of a computer. We stay this, we like to stay virtual for the most part. <laughs> we don't make stuff. We are not real, okay? We don't like to touch stuff. We don't like to be burned by those, you know, hot plastic from a 3D printer. Um, but we actually do have a Baker Lab on campus. Okay, if you take, I think, design technology, does anyone know? Okay, is it design technology? I've taken design technology classes, but I don't remember. Yeah, they have a, they have a lab, you know, uh, room 309 is uh, the design, um, that's their kind of current maker space. So you, you actually get to play with your know, 3D printers, you know, laser, you know, cutters and stuff like that. Um, do you want to add some more? I mean, no? Uh, Go ahead. Are you talking about the non um, we are well. This is uh, this is what we are planning to do, but we already have stuff going on too with uh, design technology, right? So if you look up ARC design technology, they have classes already. So this is one of the things where I think you know it is kind of cool um, for students from any discipline to be able to participate and just work with 3D printers. And they have all kinds of you know, problems to solve. I was just talking, you know, I was a little bit late today because I spent about an hour after a one hour and 30 minute meeting, I spent another hour to talk to a chemistry faculty, adjunct faculty. And he was trying to uh, use the Maker Lab on campus to make slices of a molecule so that students can visualize the, how proteins you know fold because you know apparently there's a lock and you know, key problem to these you know, protein problems so they want you know students to be, to be able to visualize you know in 3D you know how a particular protein structure is done by slicing it so now you know students can take a whole stack of slices 
and be able to kind of visualize, okay, what is inside you know, that particular structure. So I thought that was kind of cool. So the design lab, you know, on campus um, is basically for, you know, uh, people to come together and, you know, just kind of work on these problems. So people, you know, come in with chemistry problems. Uh, we have archaeology, okay? We have archaeology people walk, uh, com coming in and say, okay, we have this really precious, you know, femur uh, bone from a, as a fossil. So we don't want to hand it to students in class, you know, because you know, they might break it, right? But it's really nice to have people to just be able to, you know, kind of look at it, you know, kind of feel it, you know, how long it is in the texture. So they made uh, that bone, you know, using a 3D printer. But that bone is really long. I think it's, what, 24, 18 inches long? Okay, so it's kind of long. So most 3D printers are only good for six inches or eight inches or something like that. So they made a new bed you know, to a new mechanism so that their 3D printing capability can handle that particular bone. So, you know, it's, it's really cool, you know, for, so for those of you who are thinking, well, I, I, I like programming, I like doing stuff on the computer, but I also like, you know, hands-on stuff and solve real problems. Um, so either go take that class or look into the engineering club because, you know, they do a lot of work through the student club as well. Okay, so just a little pitch, you know, because I think if you can get through uh, the design technology classes and, you know, they, they, they are an internal intern, okay? So you actually get quote-unquote intern experience by taking that, those classes. And that can help you with, you know, your job, you know, hunting later on because, you know, instead of having a resume that has nothing on it, at least you can show that you have interned you know, as a student, you know, on campus here and actually work on something, okay? Possibly, okay? Possibly useful, you know, in your, in your future. Okay, so that's it, you know, just a little pitch, you know, because I thought it's kind of cool that we are, you know, heading in that direction. <clears throat> All right, so we are done with talking about functions. We are done with talking about relations, okay? Because last time, you know, we were just talking about relation. Um, so you have your function homework, you know, more on functions is the one that you should be focusing on right now. It is due um, on next Thursday. Is it next? No, two weeks from today. Okay, so it's due two weeks from today. Um, it is in the form of a quiz, but, you know, it's just your homework. So you just study, make sure you understand all the concepts, and then go through that. Are there any questions about this one? Nope. No questions. Alrighty. Yep. One of the quizzes was like a two hour, two time, hour limit. time limit on it. Yeah, so it's like, just like one. Two hours from the time you start it, and then like you so wait when you start you gotta have two two hours at a side, but he has to continue that time. Right, right. Okay. You can't like start and then stop and then continue? You cannot stop and continue. There's no pause button. So what I'll do is I can reset it, okay, so that you know, if you want to, you know what, for this one, you know, because the idea is to get you guys to do it, okay, you know, the idea is not to uh, limit, you know, how you can do it. So what I'll do is I'm going to reopen it. Um, it is, oh, it's going to close on the 9th, so instead of doing it using the current way, which is, which has a time limit, I'm going to disable the time limit. So this way, you know, you can spend as much time as you want on it. And I'm going to do this also. I'm going to go to, nope, not this one, layout grade, nope, right, there, right here. So I'm going to give you guys unlimited attempts, okay, which basically means, you know, if you just keep trying, you'll get it. Not that you get a concept necessarily, but you will get 100% just because you keep trying. Okay? Yeah, you you got to love quantum physics. <laughs> if you keep trying, you will get it. <clears throat> okay, so that's why, you know, so this is what I want you guys to do is to just go ahead and take the quiz. Okay? The best way to do it is to review the material ahead of time so that when you take the test, you're really testing yourself and see if you understand all the concepts. Okay? But it does give you unlimited amount of time for each attempt, and then if you fail or if you do not do so well in one attempt, you can do it again as many times as you want before the ninth, which is next Thursday. Next Thursday, today is the second. Okay. So the idea is to get you guys to do it. 
okay, not to you know, impose these limits. The point value, there's some point value associated with this one, but it's nothing compared to your second, first exam, second exam, and the final exam. Okay, so from that perspective, um, the people who you know just kind of you know copy the answer from somebody else, they are not doing themselves any good. Okay, you know, because you know, you're, the the amount of points gained by doing that is not that much. Okay. So just go ahead and try to do this by yourself, and if you're not getting why you keep getting a particular question wrong, then we can talk about it in class, or you can come to my office hour. So there you have it. So what we'll do today is we are moving back to the discussion of set theory, because we have one last thing to have to, that we have to talk about regarding the concept of sets. And this is kind of interesting because you can see how I'm interleaving these topics. I'm just, you know, not, I'm not talking about just, okay, this is set theory from start to finish because there's no way I can actually do it because we have to rely on some of the concepts of functions, some of the concepts, you know, from other things. So this is why we have to come back to this after we talk about functions because this time we are talking about, you know, whether a set is countable or not. Okay, what, did, what do we mean when we set a state a set is countable? <clears throat> in computer science, in math, okay, and the math that we need to deal with in computer science, we deal with you know, a lot of sets that are infinite in terms of the number of elements. Okay, you, there's simply no end to the number of elements. Integers, for instance, has an infinite number of elements. Okay, natural numbers, same thing. Okay. So with those particular you know, sets, you know, how do we, what do we talk about it? So what we do is we look at natural numbers. Okay? Natural numbers are very special because you know, um, the cardinality of the set of natural numbers has a special name. So when you look at the cardinality of natural numbers, it is definitely not a finite number. Okay? It's not like 2,000. Okay? Because there, there's an unlimited number of natural numbers. But nonetheless, we make it a special name. So we say that the cardinality of n, where n is the set of all natural numbers, is aleph zero. Okay, that kind of squiggly n thing is called aleph, and you can right click on this and figure out how to make it, how to draw that thing in your special editor is aleph zero. Okay. Any set, now this part is very important, any set that can be mapped to the set of natural numbers using an injective function, doesn't have to be bijective, just has to be injective, okay? So it's called countable. Okay, so now you have many other sets that has an infinite number of elements, and they are now called countable sets, okay? Integers are now countable. Okay, we'll talk about how we map integers into natural numbers. Um, rational numbers are becoming countable as well. Okay, now when you look at this end here, it is one single dimension. We are only talking about 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. But if you make any 3D space coordinate system using natural numbers as the individual axes, that 3D system is now countable. So we'll talk about how to expand from one single dimension of natural number to multi-dimensional uh, system with only natural numbers and make it countable in the process, okay? Because, you know, and the trick is how do you map, okay? So we'll talk about all of those things today. So are there any questions about the concepts that we have talked about at this point, which is basically just saying, you know, the cardinality of the set of natural number has a special name, we call that uh, L of zero. That's about it, terminology thing. Yep, go ahead. Is there a difference between a member and an element? <clears throat> uh, a member and an element are the same in this discussion. Okay. Yep. Okay, are there any questions? Yep. Are you recording? That's a good question. I believe so, but never hurts to try to check right yep so I am recording and it is recording the audio portion as well so that's good good to double check and for those of you who are really concerned about you know, my recording and think that sometimes I may actually forget or I might have equipment failure because I did have equipment failure the other day 
in another lab. Okay, the, the failure was not with my own equipment. It had to do with the USB port of that computer is too sensitive. It doesn't like having my external hard drive hanging out of it. Okay, and it just kept, it, it just kept failing. Okay, so if you are concerned about that, I do not have any problem. If you want to use your own phone for recording, okay, it's not a problem. Um, if you want to use your phone you know, where you're sitting and just turn on an audio recorder, that's cool with me. If you want to put it up here, that's cool with me. If you want to set up a little tripod so that the phone is pointing to the screen here, that's cool with me. As long as I am not in the picture, it's okay. If I'm going to be in the picture, I will have to go purchase a Darth Vader costume. <laughs> then I walked around with a, with a mask. Okay. Big helmet works too. <clears throat> but I don't have a problem if you guys want to record, if you want to pull your phone to take a picture of just one or two things on the whiteboard, it's okay. Don't ask for permission. It's implicitly permitted. Just make sure I'm not in the picture. Is that cool? All right. All right, so we'll talk about integers first, okay? So how do we map integers into natural numbers, okay? Because we need an injective function to map integers into the set of natural numbers. It has to be injective because if, if, if injection is not needed, it's easy. Map everything to zero. We're done. Here's a function, right? But we want it to be injective, which means every element in integer has to map to a unique number as a natural number. That is what we want, okay? So let's go ahead and see if we can, I'm, I'm just thinking about you know, what would be the best way to illustrate this. So I will try this first. If this doesn't work well for you guys, then we can go back to the document camera. Okay, so I'm gonna use my optimized J, uh, Math Jax you know, Previewer here. So what we have here is we want a function, I'll just call it function f. So we need to start and end the whole thing. And here's f, okay. So we need f, this f, okay, I can magnify a little bit. So we need a function f to map from a domain. In this case, the domain would consist of all the integers. And the set of all the integers is, is math b, b, c, I think. Yep, that's it, okay. Which is actually a part of your first homework assignment, right? So we want to map all of this stuff here to right arrow to natural numbers. So natural numbers is math bbn. There we go. So now we I'm just describing, okay, we have a function called f. The domain is the set of all integers, and then the codomain is the set of all natural numbers. Okay? But we want this to be injective. That is the hard part. Okay? How do we make this injective? And by doing so, okay, you know, when, when everything is said and done, this function, the function that we're going to work on, turns out to be bijective, okay? Because it turns out it is also surjective, okay? So we'll find out, you know, how this works, okay? So I'll let you guys kind of think about this a little bit and go like, okay, so here we have a whole bunch of integers, um, and how do we map the integers into natural numbers in a in an injective way? Because the problem is. Natural numbers grow only in one direction. Now, on one end, it is bound by zero. Okay, you cannot go below zero. But integers would go on both sides. Okay, you know, on the negative side, it goes. You know, keep it keeps going on the negative side. On the positive positive side, it also goes on forever. So now, how do we deal with this, right? Okay. So any any ideas? Yep. You can like map on the Yep. Odd yep. Take your pick. Okay. You know, so you can either get yeah, one or the other. Just you know, do the odd and even thing, right? Okay. So my tendency is to do it like this. Okay. So my tendency, you know, is to use um, odd numbers to represent the negative integers, and then I would use the non-negative um, integers to map to even numbers. Okay. So I'll give you a description of <coughs> f here. Just as an example, in other words, this is really a clumsy way of doing things. So let me do, a, do this as a clumsy way. 
So the clumsy way of doing things is, okay, we are mapping 0 to 0. <coughs> we are mapping uh, negative 1 to the first odd number, which is 1. We are mapping the second negative number to the second odd number, which is 3. We are mapping 1, which is the first non-negative number, to the first even number, which is 2, not counting 0. Uh, we are mapping 2 itself to 4, and so on. Is that okay? I mean, you know, is this kind of giving you an idea, at least, of how this mapping is done? It's all based on, you know, okay, if you start with a negative integer, it becomes a odd number. If you start with a non-negative integer, it becomes an even number. Yep. Natural numbers can't be decimals? Natural numbers cannot have decimals. Okay. So natural numbers are also called um, it depends on who is answering that question, because some people consider counting numbers starting with one, and then some other people do consider counting numbers to start with zero. But basically, say again? I've heard whole numbers. Whole numbers start with one, almost for sure. Okay, so there are all of these you know, kind of vague names, but you can look, look at uh, natural numbers as non-negative integers. That's what, probably the best way to look at it. Because we already know what an integer is, Okay, so we just look at all the non-negative integers. Zero itself is considered non-negative for our purposes. Okay. All right, so this is one way to describe the function, which is not in a closed form, which means, you know, well, if I just ask you what is you know, 6,013, okay, well, I guess it's really easy to work that out. You just times two, right? So, it be, so uh, that number times two becomes the natural number that it maps to. Okay, but how do we turn this into a function? How do we turn this into a closed form function, to be more exact? Okay. In, in other words, if I were to ask you to write a C subroutine to do this mapping, how would you write that subroutine? Any ideas? Okay. You need you, you need a condition. Okay, very good. So because you have to differentiate whether it is positive or negative, right? Okay. So that's a, that's a good start. Okay. So the function itself can be described kind of like this too, if you want to, is to say. Hmm, just I'm just thinking about what would what would be the best way to describe this. Um, I can do it like this, okay? So f of x is, okay, so we'll, we'll take a look at you know, this particular way of defining things. So f of x is 2x, but this happens only if um, x is a non-negative number, okay? So we'll go ahead and you know, specify that. And we, the way we do it is to say you know, x is greater than or equal to zero. implies the following. So right arrow. There we go. Is that okay? So we are if we're talking about um, non-negative integers, this is how we do it. And for those people who really do not like greater than or equal to written this way, because for all your life your math books will display it like this, we can do it that way too. Okay, so for the for all of the other ones, what if x is less than zero? If x is less than zero, then f of x is going to be an odd number, so it is one plus or one minus two x. There we go. Is that working? Hmm? Because we flip the sign, x itself is negative, so yeah. when you subtract the negative value, it is actually adding. So when x is negative 1, then we get 3. When x is negative, oh, then we're wasting one of them, right? You know, because we're wasting one itself. So let's not waste that one single value. And we'll just put a negative here. Or we can just say 2x minus 1. That's, it does, it does the same thing. 
So when x is negative 1, then negative 2x is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. So we are mapping the value of negative 1 to the first odd number, which is 1, right? So what about negative 2? You plug in negative 2 as x minus 2, negative 2 is positive 4. Positive 4 minus 1 is 3, so it should work. Is that okay? All right. Remember what I said a little bit earlier. This function is actually surjective as well. In other words, everything in the codomain is mapped. There is an inverse function to this thing. So if I just give you a natural number and ask you, oh, what integer would map to this natural number, you should be able to answer the question. Is that making, making sense? Yeah. Because if the function is surjective, I can pick anything from the codomain and say, what in the domain maps to this particular thing? Okay, so I want you to think about this a little bit, okay? And I ask you, you know, as a concrete case first, okay? Because we, it's, a concrete case is usually easier to work with. So I ask you, what is the inverse function of f, okay? Inverse of f applied to, oh, I don't know, 351, okay? What would that be? Okay, so knowing that all the negative integers are mapped to odd numbers and all the non-negative integers are mapped to even numbers, you look at this number and right away you say, oh, it's a negative integer of some kind, right? So how do you, how you, how do you reverse that? You look at this mapping here, you just have to reverse it. So how do you reverse minus 2x minus 1? Remember, it is a composite of functions. 2x is applied first, minus 1, negative 1 is applied second. So when you reverse it, you have to reverse the, the last function first. It's kind of like undoing a stack, right? So that means, you know, as the inverse function, you have to apply the <coughs> plus 1 first. Okay, so you have to say, you know, okay, whatever x is, or whatever this x is, is with 351, you add 1 to it first, and then what you do you, is you take this and you divide it by 2, okay? So instead of doing divided by 2, I can do the fancy way of using fractions. There we go. By negative 2, by the way. Okay? So what is the actual value? Can someone do go through this calculation? I really suck at arithmetic. It's negative 176. Okay. So we say this is negative 176. But you can check it, right? Because what you can do is you can say, what is f of negative 176? Okay, so you go through you know, the earlier definition. You say negative 176 is less than 0. So the definition of f says the value is minus 2 times 176. And that will give you minus 200, positive 200, 351 and then you subtract one from it and then you get uh, 351 back. Okay, so it, it kind of checks out, okay? Is that okay? All right, so in general, how do we specify the inverse function? So when you specify the inverse function, then you can say about the same thing. You basically say you have two cases. If x is odd, it is one thing. If x is even, it's the other one, okay? So we'll say, you know, if, uh, if x mod two, is zero, then we define um, f inverse as what? f inverse of x is what? Just divided by two. Okay, very good. Okay, so fraction x two, there we go. And of course, the other one is x mod 2 is 1. Then the general equation of the inverse function is something that we have seen already. Okay, you have a fraction. You divide something by negative 2, but before you do that, you have to do it the plus 1 of x. Is that making any sense? Okay, cool, all right. So now that we know how it is represented as a mathematical definition, 
How do you write that code in C or C++? So I got to relate this to programming somehow, because otherwise all those you know, game programmers will get bored and fall asleep. So I got to kind of map this back into some kind of programming stuff so that you guys have something to chew on. All right. So let's deal with f first. Okay, so int f, right? I'm not going to use unsigned, you know, just use int all the way. Okay. All right. So f itself, going forward from integers to natural numbers, um, how would you do that? I do not want to, I don't, I don't want to hear if. Yep. Can you bit shift it? And then edit bit shift it? Can you, yeah. But you, you, but you have two cases. Only one case needs a net subtract from subtract one. So you have to deal with that particular problem. Yeah, but if you if you compare the first um, like if you uh, do kind of um, yeah, if you were to compare it with a bit mass of like one zero zero zero, where you just have a leading one, then you would know if it's negative right there. And then what do you do? Uh, okay. I'd have to type all out, but um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you, you don't need to use go to's. Come on, guys. From your C class, from CISP 360, one of the things that you should have learned. Oh, ternary operator. Ternary operator, exactly. So, with a ternary operator, the first thing you say is, What is the condition? I said no if, but I didn't say no condition, right? Mm -hmm. So, you still need a condition, okay? And this is the value that it returns when the condition is true, right? Mm -hmm. So you look at the equation here and you say, oh, oh, if x is less than 0, then we want you know, minus 2 times x minus 1. And then if, it is, if the condition is false, then it is just 2 times x. We're done. One single return statement. How many people did not learn the ternary operator from any class? 360, 400, 401, 430. So everybody knows the ternary operator. Do you guys actually use it in your program when you're, okay. It is actually quite useful, okay? So get used to it. It is a very useful operator because there are occasions where you can use the ternary operator to make your program simpler. Okay, I'll give you an example. Okay, you don't have to write this down because it's not really in the scope of 440. Okay, so let's say you have the call to a particular subroutine, okay? So, and you know, you're calling it with a bunch of you know, parameters. So you're passing it x, y, z, you know, and then you have some other ones, okay? So lots and lots of parameters. So we have w, you know, and why not, okay? So let's just say it's four, okay? But depending on whether you know something is true or false, sometimes you want to pass it like this, and other times you just want to specify the subroutine call as x y, and then it is you know minus z plus twenty and w. Okay, and the only difference is the, this particular parameter, and it depends on whether k equals to b or not. Okay, so if you do not use ternary operator then you basically have to copy and paste the code and, and put, this, put this into a conditional statement. And the condition is going to be you know, whether k equals equals b or not. Right? I and mean, that's just you know, kind of how most people do it. But anytime you copy and paste, it's not good. Because you know, the other parameters are identical. So if you copy and paste, and then later on find out that, oh, this is not supposed to be x, both of these are supposed to be x plus 1, then you have two places to fix that. Okay, so instead of doing it that way, you can now say, oh, we can just fix this one. You can use a ternary operator here and say if k and b are the same, then we want to use z. Otherwise, we want to use it as minus z plus 20. So you change one single parameter to use a ternary operator instead of turning this entire thing into a full-blown conditional statement using if. Okay, so there are places where this can be handy, and not only handy, but it is actually appropriate. Okay, um, because C is very funny. C is really funny in, a man, in many ways. You can use a comma, okay, in order to do multiple things as a part of one single expression. 
How many people know that comma in C is an operator? Okay, very good. So two people know about it. So this is uh, kind of cool because you can have a whole bunch of expressions and they're comma separated and you can turn that, it will still be considered as a single expression but it has the function of kind of like a block because you're doing all of those operations sequentially, okay? And with the comma separated expression, the loss, the value of the loss expression becomes the expression of the entire comma separated expression. So you can get away with a lot of stuff. This cannot do loops, okay? But you can do, you can get away with um, not using, you know, curly braces if you only need conditional statements, you can use the trend operator in conjunction with the comma separated expression. And you can get away with you not using statements at all. You can just use expressions. The big deal of expression is an expression can go into a parameter. So it, it opens up all kinds of possibilities. Does it make your code any easier to read? Probably no. But that's only because we are not trained to write programs this way. And there's one more thing I want to add that is not, well, entirely related to 440, but in a way it is. We cannot do loops with this. But since I have recursion, I have my loops back. Because for anything that is iterative, anything that uses a for loop, a while loop, or anything like that, you can turn it into a recursive version where you don't need to have a loop. So give me recursion, give me comma separated expression, give me ternary operation, and I can you I can write any program in C now without using statements. Okay, I take it back. I need a return statement. So your entire <laughs> C subroutine is return and then followed by la 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 as a big, huge, long comma separated expression that is probably nested with ternary operators in it. There are programming languages just like that. They're not C, it is, it's not the C programming language, but if you look into Lisp, L-I-S-P, Lisp is exactly like that. It has no expression, has no uh, loops as, and, as a statement, has a very rudimentary way of doing um, conditional statements, and everything is an expression. In fact, everything is a list. So it's a, it's a kind of nifty, neat programming language. But I just want to point out all of these things because you know, uh, if you did not learn about this, a comma separated list in C is really considered a, an expression. Um, this may be something that you want to look into because you know it can give you, you know, some way of cleaning up code. It's it's not needed for the most part, but it can give you a different way of writing programs. So next time when you turn in a program to uh, Professor Fox or Professor Subsevery that has no for, no while, is only making use of these two, you know, just, just leave my name out of it. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> because they should know this stuff also, right? All right, so we are done with integers. Are there any questions? Let me go back to that page and see if there's any question regarding the mathematical definition of f, as also the uh, and also the c implementation of that function. This is all good. All right. So I will kind of leave it up to you guys to define the inverse function, which can also be done with a single return statement with a ternary operator. Um, it's just that one is divided by two, the other one is adding one first and then divided by negative two. But other than that, okay, it looks about the same. Is that okay? All right. Okay. So we're going to go back to the notes here, and we're moving on to two-dimensional natural number coordinates. Okay. So this time, our function is, need, is needs to do this n times n, the Cartesian product of natural number with natural number, we need to map this space to the space of just natural numbers. Okay? So in a way it is kind of like that, in, in like the first problem, but in a way it is actually, it sounds a lot harder because we have a two-dimensional space, I'm trying to fold a 2D space into a 1D space. 
How do we do it? Well, you know, the, um, the numbers right below that is a somewhat graphical way of showing you how we can do this. So the way we do this is we fill up the 2D space diagonal, okay? You know, just looking at the number doesn't really necessarily tell you how it is done. So maybe if I just do it on the whiteboard once, you know, you can see the dynamics, then you can say, oh, okay, so that's how it's done. So here's the, your two-dimensional space, okay? And it is only using natural numbers on both axes, okay? So you got zero to the positive integers here. You get zero to positive integers, integers over here. And you want to map every single pixel in this space to a single natural number as quote unquote the coordinates, right? So the way you do it is you start with a zero here, okay? And which way you traverse the diagonals is up to you, okay? Just naturally, you know, I would go from the lower portion to the upper portion. So I put a one here and I put a two here. And then, so that takes care of one diagonal line. So I start with this, the third diagonal line, which is three, four, five. Then I go with the fourth diagonal line, uh, six, seven, eight, nine. And you know, that's basically what you see on the projector. But I can keep going, right? You know, 10 goes here, 11, 12, 13, 14, and so on. I can keep doing this until, until you know, the, the ink dries and you know, run out of space on the whiteboard, you know, because this space is infinite, okay? It goes, keeps on going and going, but this approach doesn't stop because there's always the next diagonal line. Is that making any sense? So intuitively speaking, most people would say, look at this and go like, yep, it's definitely injective. Okay? In other words, give me a coordinate. It has its own unique number. But it is also surjective. Okay? Pick any space, pick any square within this space. It has a number on it. If you give me that number, I can reverse the process and tell you the actual coordinate of that particular cell. Is that making sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the rest of this slide, or the majority of the rest of this slide, is really just to give you a closed form of the function and also the inverse function. Okay, if you give me the coordinate of a particular cell, how do I know the natural number that it's supposed to map to? If you give me just a natural number of a particular cell, how do I compute the x and y coordinate of that particular cell? Okay, so the rest of this note is all about the math to do that. Is that okay? So we are moving into, so the how, okay, remember the three questions. Why we, we are doing this, what is this, and how we are gonna do it, okay? The why is basically saying, Okay, it is helpful to be able to see some domain that we naturally do not think is countable or has any special property as a countable space because it can map, it can be mapped to the natural number space. That's the why. The what in this case is the, we're dealing with a 2D space. We want to figure out you know, how do we fold a 2D space of natural numbers into a 1D space of natural numbers. That's, that's the what. So the rest of this is the how, that the, 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 this is the gritty, you know, the detail part of the implementation. Okay, so what do we do is we say, okay, I'll give you the x-coordinate, I'll give you the y-coordinate, and I want a function to tell me what is the natural number mapped to this particular cell. That's the question, okay? How would you solve this problem? What, what are you noticing about these things first to give you an idea of, mm, I think I got you know, a starting point to get this done. So what I want you to do is to do this, okay? See if we can figure out you know, a particular pattern because the pattern is the important part. So we want to look at these diagonals, okay? This is a trivial one, you know, it only has one single cell, it's just a zero. This one is one, two, okay, starts with one, this is three, four, five, starts with three. This one is six, starts with six. And you look at the baseline here, okay? It is zero, one, three, six, ten. Can you guess which one is gonna be next? It's gonna be 15, right? And then the next one is gonna be 21. How do we know that? 
Right, so the delta between these numbers keep going up by one, right? Yeah. But why is that? It has to do with the diagonals get longer by only one cell as you go in this direction. Okay? That's, that's cool. Okay, we have that observation. So that means, you know, when we get to this particular one, it belongs to a particular diagonal line, but it's not here, right? The diagonal line that it does belong to is all the way over here. It is projecting you know, that line over here. Is that okay? All right. So how do we know, you know, what is the number starting here? Can we tell that by the coordinate x, y itself? Okay, so let, let's, let's see if we can observe a pattern, okay? This is how I solve the problem, okay? None of this solution is from the web. I did not search on Wikipedia. I did not have a textbook. You know, I gave myself a problem. I know it is bijective, okay? I know the function is bijective. I know, you know, how it works, you know, just by working out the example. But I want to find the closed form for the function. And I did not search, you know, you know, for the function, I derived it. But how do we derive it? Okay, let's let let's take a step back. Okay, before I go in this round, how does this has have anything to do with programming? This is math stuff. This is abstraction, right? You know, I look at a particular problem. I look at you know, okay, you know, I can work out a few numbers like this. I will start to notice a pattern, and then I try to abstract and say, okay, this pattern tells me that in general, you know, this is how things work. How does that process relate to programming? What is a program doing? Any program, give me any program, well, except for Hello World. <laughs> it's a bunch of instructions, okay. So what is those instructions applied to? What is applicable to a program? Okay, but the, I guess the question is, does your programs only solve one very, very specific problem, or does it solve a class of problems? Class. It solves a class of problems, right? So even if you have a sorting algorithm implemented in C, and you hard code the whole thing and say, I can only deal with integers, and I can only deal with up to five integers, or exactly five integers, it is still a general solution because you are not limiting what the values of those five integers are, lo are limited to, right? Th those five integers can come in completely unsorted. They can be sorted in a reverse way. They can be totally random and totally scattered. And your program will still be able to solve that problem. So, you, so every single program is a generalized solution to a class of problems. And so when you write programs, the process of writing a program is abstraction. It is losing details that are not important. So you get to the essence. You're boiling things down. You're, you're boiling solutions all the way down to the bone, down to you know, the only the stuff that matters. That is programming. I'm doing exactly the same thing, except this is not programming. It is solving a math equation. Okay? But it takes exactly the same kind of skill set to do it. Okay, so what we do is we look at these numbers and say, okay, can we look at you know, these values and does it give me a clue of which diagonal line it belongs to? Okay, so we look at, let's say the third one, okay? So the third diagonal line starts with three, four, five. The fourth diagonal line starts with six, seven, eight, nine. So when we pick one of these numbers, can we use that number to tell you know, which what is the diagonal line? Diagonal line that starts with that. What is the base of that diagonal line? That's the question. What do you think? So eight is corresponding to the coordinate of one and uh, zero, one, two. Okay. So is there a correlation there? The number minus the y coordinate. Say again? The number minus the y value. The so 8 minus 2 is 6. 8 minus 2 is 6, and 6 is the base. Okay, very good. Does it work with the other ones? 
Does it work with this guy? 7 minus the y coordinate is 6. Very good. Okay, so you're, you're noticing a pattern. So when we apply that pattern to this particular coordinate, which is x, y, so we know one thing, okay? We know that whatever value is the base of this thing here, okay, so we'll call this you know, uh, b over here, we know that um, f of x, y, which is the value over here, okay? If you subtract b, excuse me, if you subtract y from it, b, which is the value at the base of this diagonal line, is gonna establish this, this equality. Okay, that's a good observation, very good. Okay, but how, uh, it still doesn't tell me where d is, okay? So what do I do next? Because I'm only given the x, y coordinate, I have just made use of y, okay? Y is utilized. Can I utilize x to help me in this case? So you look at this x here. Now x actually is actually quite useful because you know it will tell you the, the value over here. Okay, this the base of this thing, you know, it will tell you that. But x also tells you something else. Okay, let, let me see if someone else can, can point this out. Say it, say it one more time. Now, if you, the way we use y is we subtract y from, let's see, we subtract y from f of x, x y to, be, to get to b, okay? Can we do something about x to get to the, the other intercept? Okay. From B. So like how many basically how many what you, it tells you how many numbers you have to add to B to equal where it is. So okay. like um B say basically <coughs> plus Y will equal whatever that location is. So you put every number there, whatever number it is in a box. <coughs> Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. So let's let's do that one more. Time. Let's you know, kind of like project this to a over here. Okay, this is not to scale. Okay. So what is a again? F x y plus plus x. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So it looks like you know x and y together has something to do with this a and the b. But we know the difference between the a and the b because you know that's the length of that diagonal line. Okay, so what we want to do next is to look at, what if you look at just the summation of the x, y of a coordinate, okay? Let's see if that has anything to do with the value at a particular cell. Zero is easy, okay, because, you know, zero plus zero, zero plus this zero is this zero. Okay, cool. This one here, okay, one is the x coordinate, y is, co is zero, the sum of the coordinates is one. Now, this one doesn't seem to work out, okay? Um, let's pick another one, pick up this one here, okay? So the x coordinate is a two, the y coordinate is a one, so it doesn't add up, okay? But it does give you some kind of clue, okay? Do, do we see any clues like that? In other words, if you know this is a part of the diagonal line, can you count which diagonal line we are dealing with? Can you count, is it the first diagonal line, the second diagonal line, the third diagonal line, or the fourth diagonal line? But how do we know that? Everything in the fourth diagonal line has x plus y equal to four, okay? Well, I think it's, it's three, I, I'm off by one here. Okay, because this is three, right? Three plus zero is three. What about this guy? It's two, one. Two plus one is three. What about this guy? One plus two is three. What about this guy? 
the last one on that diagonal line. 0 plus 3 is 3. So the sum of the x and the y gives you a clue of which diagonal line, diagonal line we're dealing with. Okay, So that is really useful <coughs> because it tells us something. x plus y is, the, is which diagonal line we're dealing with. But do we know the base of that diagonal line? We sort of do, right? OK, so let's, let's just you know, look at x and y. And we, we call this k for now, OK? Just so that we don't keep referring to it as x plus y, which is you know, basically you know, we count the diagonal line looking at the first one as 0, OK? Do we know the number at the base of that diagonal line? Well, we saw that earlier. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 plus 3 is 6. 6 plus 4 is 10, and so on. So if you know your k, you know what your b is supposed to be corresponding to that k. Because your b, okay, if I want to spell it out, is 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way to this k here. Is that making any sense? So this b is the summation you know, of 0, oh, I'm missing a 1 here, 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to this k. And the k is really just the sum of your x, y coordinate. This is giving us something to work with. I look at this, okay, none of, all of this is actually in the notes as well. So it's just you know, kind of really a lot more boring because it is, there's, there are no pictures and it's all text, okay? So when you, when you, but we want to work it out. So I can put a summation here to go from 0 to k, like that. And this is a summation of i, right? Are there any questions about the, the use of the summation, the sigma you know, notation? Or does everybody understand, you know, sigma means, you know, summation of, and then we use i as an index, and then this is the expression that we are just, we are adding to the sum. Is that part okay or not? That part is okay? Cool. Okay. Um, is there a close form for something like this? Now, when I ask for a close form, what I'm asking is um, 0 plus 1 is a 1. Cool. Um, 0 plus 1 plus 2 is 3. The next one is oops, 6 and so on. So what I'm really asking is can you express f of k, this is a function I cannot use, I should not use f here, but can we come up with a closed form equation? You know, if I give you the boundary, okay, this is all the way up to k, can I use an equation? Can I use a formula on this side to tell you the, the value of this summation? How do we do it? Come on, you guys have seen this before in at least your sorting algorithm or possibly your sort uh, your search. Definitely your sorting algorithm because to count to make sure that the bubble sort is you know to the is big O of n squared. You have seen this or at least something similar to this. How do we simplify this? Okay, what, what you might notice is, okay, if you add the first item to the last item, it gives you 1k, right? You add the second item and the second last item, you get another k, right? So that means you have approximately k divided by two many of k's, right? I said approximately because you know, they're not exactly the same, right? Okay, so, so you start with this kind of observa observation and go like, well, it's kind of close to that, but it's not exactly that. Why is it not exactly that? So it be an odd number. Of there's an odd number thing, right? Okay, so if there's an odd number thing, what do you, how do you deal with it? Okay, we know the whole thing has some kind of divided by two. We know there's some k over here. So you say, hmm, what about this? Would that work? So you plug it in and see if it works, right? So you have an observation. So you say, well, maybe it's like this. Generate, and then you test it. You validate it. So you say, oh, what if k is 1? Does it work? Hmm, doesn't work at all. 
So I made a stupid mistake because, well, let's try that, right? Does that work? Okay, you have k times k plus one, and then the whole product divided by two. When k is one, okay, k is one, k plus one is two, one times two is two, two divided by two is, ah, two. I'm done, let's move on. No, 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 okay? That's not good, okay? So we try the second one, okay? Zero plus one plus two, so k is two in this case, right? So you, you plug in k equals to two into this equation here. Forget about this one. Two times three is six. Six divided by two is three. Ah, we got it. Okay, is it, is it good enough for you to convince you that this is the actual closed form? Not for me. Let's try the next one, k equals to three. When k equals to three, you have three times four, which is 12. 12 divided by two is, in fact, six. Okay, so I can keep doing it like this. I can use a spreadsheet to do it, okay? And that will not be enough to prove to me that this works in general, okay? Because everything that I have up to here is, is good enough as validation that I cannot prove myself wrong yet, but it doesn't prove me right either. Okay, so let's take a little moment here. We'll take a short break of all of this math stuff, okay? So instead, I'll tell you a story of my graduate school. You, go, you guys go like, ah, that's worse, tag, please move on, do something else. No, no, this is my story, okay, in graduate school. So in graduate school, I was doing research on, um, you know, my, the, the, the title of my dissertation is, um, I have to I have to write it to remember it. Stochastic admissible heuristic search. That's it. Okay. Stochastic admissible heuristic search. And the funny part is, other than the um, stochastic part, you will understand all of the other ones by the end of this semester. So you guys will know what is admissible, you will know what is a heuristic, and you will also know search algorithms, at least two of them. Okay? So anyway. Um, when I started to work on my dissertation, there was one particular theorem that says blah, 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 okay, and intuitively it seems to make sense, okay, it seemed to me that it makes sense too. So my advisor just said, okay, you can start with these uh, research that has been done already, so you don't have to redo all of everything from scratch, just start with this, okay. So in about two or three weeks into this research, you know, it suddenly started to kind of I have this gut feeling that you know it's not entirely right. So I kept I kept asking my advisor and go like, well, where's the actual proof of this particular theorem? Because even though it seemed to make sense, it seemed to be intuitive, I just don't have a good feeling that it is entirely right. I just want to read the proof to convince myself that this theorem is true, because before I started to use it as the basis of my entire dissertation. Okay. So my advisor kept saying, well, it's been done already in somebody else's master's you know, thesis, um, so you don't have to do it. So I went back and actually read that you know, thesis, and the only thing mentioned about this theorem was, well, the famous old word. Obviously, blah, 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 it's true. I felt like, well, that's not really obvious to me. It kind of makes sense in a way, but it is not obvious to me. So I talked to my professor, my advisor again, my advisor said, oh, don't get bugged by it, you know, it's good, okay, you know, because my other students are also using this theorem as their basis. I'm like, well, that's not enough for me to, to convince me that this is true. So I spent one week, okay, to find a counterexample to prove the theorem wrong. So the theorem was actually wrong because I was able to construct a case in which the theorem was incorrect, it is false. So I came back to my professor the, the, that following week on the Friday. We always meet on Fridays. We always met on Fridays. And then my, the only comment that I got out of my professor was, hmm, that was it. So I went back to the lab and talked to the other guys in the lab. And one guy just went ballistic because he was almost done with his, with his own master's thesis based on that theorem. And now that theorem turned out to be false. 
So he went ballistic. Fortunately, he knew where to direct his anger. It wasn't toward me. It was to uh, my advisor because you know it was his. It was my advisor who said, "Yeah, go ahead and use this theorem. It's okay." It turned out to be not okay. So that's why you know I did not stop by just you know, validating a few points and go like, "Yeah, it seems to work." Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to prove it. Okay. Prove is good, okay? So how do we prove something like that, okay? Now this is ahead of time, you know, I'm doing something slightly ahead of time. So, okay, so what we'll do is we'll say, so don't worry if you do not understand it completely at this point, but this is kind of like an exposure thing. If you go to the uh, syllabus of this class, if you go through all the topics, um, it has proof by induction in it, right? It has proof by induction. So if you if I use a textbook to teach this class, then we'll spend like you know, one lecture or something like that to just talk about proof by induction. But I don't like to talk about proofs just on its, as its own topic because it doesn't really help you guys sink in, sink in you know, the idea. So whenever I can see something that I can use a proof, proof by induction in this case, I'll use it. So you guys will have multiple exposure to the technique called proof by induction in this class to solve various problems, to prove the various theorems, okay? So this is the first one, okay? So the theorem that I have is, um, is this, okay? So for all integers or natural numbers, natural <coughs> numbers, um, we'll call it n, okay? Um, the summation, summation, um, and since I can't really use the sigma, you know, on, on a, using a regular text editor, I'm just going to do it this way. So the summation i going from 0 to k, to n in this case, um, i is um, n times n plus 1 divided by 2. That is the, that's the theorem, okay? So the theorem is just, you know, telling you a equality in this case. And basically just say, oh, for all natural numbers and, you know, um, the summation, which is one side of the equality, equals to the other side of the equality. But it's only a theorem, okay? It is not a statement saying that it is the case. This is just a theorem. Somebody proposed that this equality holds for all possible ends in this natural number, okay? So if I want to cast this, you know, into the mathematical equation thing, I'm going to erase this part here, <coughs> okay. then the theorem is basically saying for all, okay, uh, you put parentheses around the whole thing first, okay. then I can say for all and for all, okay, so for all n as an element of natural numbers n, okay, the following is true, okay, what do you mean by the following? following would include the summation. So if I remember correctly, it is not using uh, sigma. I think it's just sum. The subscript i goes from 0, and then the superscript goes to uh, n itself here. And then the expression that I'm really summing over is just i by itself. Okay. So this whole thing is the fraction of n times n plus 1, and then the whole thing divided by 2. In other words, I'm just re-spelling out, you know, the, uh, what I stated a little bit earlier, and I think I missed the parentheses 1. There was one that is supposed to be, it's not supposed to end here, it's supposed to end over here. There we go. So I think this is better. There we go. Okay. Are, are we good on this one? This is a, this is a theorem, which can be true, can be false, right? Because if I can find a particular natural number, let's say 65, okay, where the summation of 0 to 65 does not equal to 65 times 65 plus 1, the whole thing divided by 2, then the theorem is false, okay? So this is a pretty big statement saying that this is true for every single natural number n. Okay, good so far? So I'm going to prove this by induction, okay? Proof by induction is a very cool technique because it maps to a certain type of programming. Can anyone guess what type of programming I'm talking about? Recursion, exactly. So if you have a recursive algorithm, 
it lends itself to proof by induction. Okay, so proof by induction says you know okay I need a base case. Okay, so let me use math tt and say where's my base case? Okay. TT may not be the best one. I think RM would be better. There we go. Okay, so base the base case is basically saying, okay, uh, tell me a trivial case or the one end of the range of numbers that we're supposed to work with, and just prove to me that that one end of the numbers that I'm supposed to work with, this theorem holds true. We're dealing with natural numbers, right? So we have a natural end of a natural number. Which end should that be? The smaller one or the large end? The small one, zero, is a natural termination of natural numbers, right? Because we start with zero. Okay. So we're basically saying, okay, um, if n equals to zero, what, what's going to happen? So for the case that n equals to zero, um, is that equation holding up? Okay. So I'm going to be lazy here and I'm just going to copy and paste this thing and say, well, what is the actual summation itself? Remember, n is zero. So if I'm adding, huh? we set n to one. Oh, n. I have to set it to zero. Sorry. Yeah. So if I set n to zero, which is my base case, what is the actual summation? If I just look at the summation part itself, what is adding zero to zero? It's just zero. Okay, cool. Okay, that's just zero itself. Um, and then I plug in n equals to zero to the uh, fraction notation here, right? So what is zero times zero plus one, the whole thing divided by two? That turns out to be zero too. Okay. So the theorem is true for the base case now. Okay, so the base case you know, where n equals to zero is proven. Okay. So this is the tricky part. The base case is usually the easiest part because you know you usually the theorem is obviously true for one end of the range of numbers that the theorem is supposed to work in. So the induction step is the next one. So math rm induction step. It doesn't do the space unfortunately, so it's gonna look kind of awkward. Okay, so the induction step is saying that we assume that the theorem is true for every case up to k, okay? Just pick a number k. Can we use that assumption that it works all the way up to k to prove that it also works for k plus one? Okay, so we assume it works for k, okay? So we basically say um, the summation, I'm just gonna be, once again, a little bit lazy by recycling stuff here. Okay, so we say assume that you know, when you substitute n with k, this does turn out to be true. Okay, so k, k plus 1, the whole thing divided by 2. Okay, so it is assuming, okay, we assume this is true. But can we prove that it will also work for k plus 1? Okay, so let's see how this is going to work out. Okay, so... So in this case, we say, okay, now that we have the proof for the case k plus 1, let's start with that. Okay, so we cannot stop with k anymore, it is now k plus 1, right? Can we rewrite, you know, the summation of i equals to 0 to k plus 1i uh, to the assumption a little bit? Can, can we switch back to that one? Yeah, that's easy, because all we have to say is, oh, we just separate the k plus 1 out of the summation, and then we just use the old summation up to just k itself. Okay, is that okay? Is this equality um, okay with you guys? Because all I did is to you know, pull the last item out of the big O summation, and separate it on its own, and then we are just reusing the old summation, which has one fewer term than the one that we are dealing with at this point. Is that okay? Okay. So, but now I can say, hey, I have the assumption, okay? Because remember, I had this assumption here. So, because I had that assumption, this term is now that term because of the assumption of the induction step, okay? So the assumption is actually uh, very, very important because now I can say this. 
Is that okay? Because I just took the summation of i equals to zero to ki and say, hey, according to the assumption, um, that is k times k plus one divided by two. Is that okay? All right. So the next step is to say, well, okay, this looks kind of ugly. I want to put everything, you know, in the fraction. Okay, so we'll go ahead and just have one single fraction here. Everything is divided by two. And then the top side is now, you know, two times k plus one, you know, to take care of this k plus one. I'm just basically multiplying, you know, both the numerator and the denominator by two, okay? Um, but then I can, you know, combine that with what I had in the second part. Is that okay? This is just algebra for the most part. Is it good? Yeah. Okay, all right. So now I can look at this and go like, hmm, I can do some factoring. Right, I can do the factoring because k plus one is common to both of these products. So I can factor out k plus one, okay. But once I factor out k plus one, then I have two plus k left. So I'm going to write it in exactly the same order, just so that you know it is clear that this is the result of just you know, factoring. Okay. Hmm. I look at this thing here and go like, hmm. I can start to see a pattern, you know, something that I really want, because now I can rewrite the terms like so. So I would keep I would keep k plus one the same way as it used to be, and then I'm going to say, oh, two plus k is k plus one plus one. That's kind of obvious, right? But I'm only one step away from proving my theorem. Because the only thing I'm left to do in this case is to group one of the k, group the k plus one into its own term. Now I have I'm done with the theorem. Because now I have established the equality all the way from here, okay? All the way to here. In other words, this the, the theorem is now working when n equals to k plus one. So once you prove the base step or prove a base case in proof by induction, you make the assumption that the theorem is true all the way up to a particular number, make it k. Okay, pick a notation. All you have to do is to use that assumption to prove that it also works for the next step, then you're done with your proof. So now I feel comfortable that my original theorem is true because I have rigorously proved the theorem. I did not just spot check it with you know, a few numbers. I have just gone through a rigorous proof where each step, okay, you know, at least to me, is obvious enough. You know, if you feel that you know, one of these steps is not obvious to you, let me know because I really do not like to skip steps. Not in a class, not when I'm actually proving theorems for my own purposes. Okay? So we are running out of time for today, but this is your first exposure to proof by induction, okay, which I feel is kind of important. So I'll see you guys next Tuesday where we will continue with this derivation. Okay, you'll fold in 2D space to 1D space.